invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I thought we would just read again uh, verses 19 through 26. Again, taking a little break from the, uh, our study in Romans uh, to do this study on the theology of worship. So um, anyway, we'll be reading, re- reading uh, John 4, 19 through 26. Familiar story, the woman at the well. And uh, let's read, picking up verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem on this mountain, our fathers worshiped, I'm sorry, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this encounter uh, that Jesus had with this woman and it being recorded by your spirit and the lessons it has for us, Father, particularly in the area of worship. Father, we pray that you would use this message today, you would use this series, Father, to conform our worship to you, Father, that it would truly be in spirit and in truth, that you would truly be worshiped and glorified as you deserve, as you are worthy of. So, Father, um, bless us now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So again, last week we began our study on the theology of worship based on a series of lectures that I heard years ago by Dr. Bruce Leafblad, a professor of worship. And we began by examining this encounter Jesus had with this Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. We find here that she received much more from Jesus than she expected, and perhaps even what we expected from this text because in Jesus' words to her, we find the foundational, the foundational teaching to the whole subject of worship in the New Testament. We noted, first of all, that Jesus said the Father is seeking true worshipers. That's ultimately why the Father sent the Son into the world. At the heart of humanity's uh, sin problem and threat of God's judgment, is that man does not worship God. As we talked about last week, it's not that people are just choosing not to worship, like we see with the drop-off in church attendance over the the last few years, people just simply choosing not to participate in Sunday services. No, worship is actually unavoidable. Everyone worships. The only question is who we worship and how we worship, but everyone without exception worships. And so the sin problem is that everyone is choosing to worship other inferior objects over the one, the only one worthy of our praise. And so Jesus came to save us from our false worship and make us true worshipers, worshiping the right God in the right way. Dr. Leafblad defines worship as, quote, that spiritual activity 
in which, in which and through which we define for ourselves what has the greatest priority in our lives. Let me read that again. De- worship is defined as, quote, that spiritual activity in which and through which we define for ourselves what has the greatest priority in our lives. Worship is about priorities, what we prioritize most in our lives. It's what is at the core of who we are. And so Jesus gives us two qualifications for when we know our worship is true, that that we are worshiping the right God in the right way. He says in verse 23, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Those are the two qualifications, in spirit and in truth. Now, last week, we covered what worshiping in truth means. To worship in truth, we must understand the truth about God and the truth about man. Sometimes we call these truths the doctrine of God and the the doctrine of man. We could mention other doctrines related to to these, but but the, the main thing to remember is that the Bible is the final authority and an ultimate source of truth. So if we are to worship in truth, it requires that we look to the scriptures and follow closely what it teaches. We must worship God according to his way, according to the truth as he defined it, and not what we concoct in our own minds. We are sinful and do not naturally know what is right or best, but God does, and he has instructed us in his word. So now we want to turn to what it means to worship in spirit. And to do that, let's look then at verse 24, where Jesus says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Now, we we need to answer a question there before we can understand what it means to worship in spirit. And that is, what does it mean that God is spirit? The fact that God is spirit seems to be determinative of what it means to worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit and, or maybe therefore, his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. That seems to be the the logic there. So again, what does it mean that God is spirit? Well, first, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God is the Holy Spirit because it would be incorrect to say that God is is the Holy Spirit. We could say that the Holy Spirit is God, meaning he is one of the three persons of the Trinity along with the Father and the Son, but we couldn't say that God is the Holy Spirit because God is more than just the Holy Spirit. He is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So so what we might, so we, what he must be speaking of about here is the nature of God. The nature of God. God is spirit, meaning he has no physical form. He has no physical form. And so because God is spirit and has no physical form, his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We've we've already covered the truth part, as we mentioned, but what, again, what does it mean to worship in spirit? Take a quick swallow. What does it mean to worship in spirit? Well, if Jesus is using the argument of God's own nature being spirit and not physical, then it would stand to reason that man's focus of worship is to be focused on the spirit and not the physical. We know from Genesis 1 that, that man was made in the image of God. Does this mean a physical image of God? No, of course not. We were made in the image of God in spirit. We are made in the image of God on the inside, meaning we are also spiritual beings. We have a soul, and through our soul or spirit, we are able to relate to God like other creatures cannot. Our spirits are on the inside. So just as God is spirit, we, he must be worshiped in spirit, which is 
on the inside. And of course, that would make sense as Jesus seems to contrast the old focus of a physical place of worship, which was Samaria or Jerusalem in verse 21. Uh, he's, he's, he seems to be contrasting that to the new focus of worshiping in spirit, worshiping Christ in spirit or on the inside. Now, one other thing to let me, clar- let me clarify here before we go on is that this is not talking about some state of being, okay? Uh, in other words, to say worship in spirit means worship on the inside is not an excuse for inaction, okay? It's not an excuse for inaction. No, worshiping God from the inside involves much action. Worship is a verb before it is a noun, but it happens on the inside, in spirit. So this morning, I'm going to give you three statements, three statements that describes three categories of what it means to worship in spirit, okay? These these are three categories most commonly used to describe the spiritual act of worship, all right? So all three of these statements are going to sound very similar. I'm just going to change two words each time, okay? And I'll, I'll repeat them twice. So you'll get them, and then I'll repeat them again as we go along in, in the sermon. First, worship is the spiritual action of the mind by which we affirm God as first in our values. I'll say that again. Worship is the spiritual action of the mind by which we affirm God as first in our values, all right? Number two, worship is the spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm God as first in our affections. Worship is the spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm God as first in our affections. And then thirdly, Worship is the spiritual action of the will which we affirm, by which we affirm God as first in our commitments. Worship is, the, worship is the spiritual action of the will by which we affirm God as first in our commitments. So we're going to look at each of these. These are our three points here. So we're looking at the mind, the heart, and the will. The mind, the heart, and the will. So we begin with the mind. Again, worship is the spiritual action of the mind by which we affirm God as first in our values. What Leaf Blood means by this is that we are value-driven beings by nature. We are value-driven beings by nature. We prove that by how we put a price tag on everything. Whether we are shopping for a car house or a bowl of oatmeal, there is a price tag or for our purposes here, a statement of evaluation. The price tag is the seller's evaluation of an item's value. And then the buyer comes in and gives his evaluation. He looks at the price and decides if it's worth it or not. If not, he doesn't buy it. And the things in our value systems are structured from top down, from the highest to the lowest. So one's value system is a hierarchy of values that is dominated by the highest value. Let me say that again. Our value system is a hierarchy of values that is dominated by the highest value. So whatever or whomever is at the top of that hierarchy is our God. The definition of the word God in Webster's Dictionary is a person or thing of supreme value. And that God is preeminent over everything else in a person's life. So to put this in layman's terms, true worship is valuing the true God above everything else. 
If we are truly worshiping God, he will be that object of ultimate worth and value over everything else in our lives. The Bible affirms him to be the highest value. There is nothing of equal value. The one who created all things is of greater value than all that he created. So he should be worshipped. In actuality, nothing else should be worshipped. Nothing else should come close. The first commandment tells us, you shall have no other gods or no other objects of ultimate worth before me or beside me. Nothing else should be treated as ultimate worth because there is nothing else of ultimate worth. Only God is. So folks, if we are to be true worshipers of God, we must agree. We must agree with the price tag that the Bible puts on God, that God puts on himself and value him as most important in our lives. To not do so would be to worship God falsely, to worship in vain. And so we must understand, we must understand that the, the, the establishment of a value to something begins in the mind. We must understand that the establishment of a value to something begins in the mind. The problem for many people in this world is that they don't use their minds they don't stop and truly evaluate what they are doing. And they, and they value things and they worship things that have very little real value. They give themselves to these things. They should never give themselves to. Or, or they take things that is of great value and make it the ultimate value above God. That's a very common thing. Taking good things, good things we should value, but making them the ultimate value. And in doing so, they can actually harm that object that they put above God because it wasn't meant to be or designed to be of ultimate value. It can't bear that weight. It can't bear that load. It was never intended to. You see this, for instance, with parents that elevate their children above God. You see this when they, for instance, don't discipline their children when they disobey in order to teach them that, you know, that, that there's an authority that they are to live under. And it's not, it's not just their parents, it's ultimately God. Well, they make their child the center of the family. Whatever they perceive is best for the child trumps every other consideration. They skip, church, they skip church worship services regularly for the child's activities. They don't require that their children respect them or others. The mother of the child will reject God's order in the family by rejecting their husband's will, their, 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 their head, their spiritual head, rejecting his will when, the, when he, the father, wants to discipline their child. That's examples of how we can see this happening, that they are worshiping the child above, above God. And, and what happens is, 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 is that this object of greatest value, their child, is trained to be self-consumed, to be the center of, of everything, and by that they are spiritually ruined, and, and the parents don't realize it until it's too late. Folks, what do you value? What do you value? Who do you give ultimate value to? We can, we, we can really do it with anything good or bad. We just need to use our minds and think. Do you know that worship is actually a shortened word? It really means worth-ship. What, 
What do you show as ultimate worth by your worthship? This is so important, folks. This is so important because what we value is what we give ourselves to. So what we value of ultimate worth is what we give ourselves ultimately to. Worship. There are three hymns recorded in Revelation 4 and 5 that all begin the same way. Worthy. Worthy. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. Or Revelation 5.12, worthy is the lamb who was slain. We worship him because he alone is worthy. Next, we have the heart. Dr. Leaflot says, worship is the spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm God as first in our affections. Our affections are our deep feelings, right? When a man has affection for a woman, he has deep feelings for her. He loves her. In the same way, worship is the spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm our deepest feelings are for God. Our ultimate love is for Him. And this shouldn't be new to us. The scriptures certainly back this up. Our scripture reading earlier, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. What does it say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And when Jesus is asked about what the greatest commandment is, he quotes this verse. He basically sums up the law as love for God. We obey because we love God. In John chapter 14, verse 15, the King James Version mistranslates the Greek in that second clause uh, there as an imperative, as a command, reading, if you love me, keep my commandments. But it should be translated as a future indicative, as a statement of fact, as the ESV does, which says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's a statement of fact. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience will flow out of a true love for God. If we love him, we will obey him. It, has, it was always intended to be this way, folks. It was always intended to be this way. Our obedience is supposed to flow from our hearts. And we know that that's not always the case in other realms. For instance, there are rules in life that we have to follow simply because we have to. If you are like me, you don't particularly enjoy following some of the traffic laws in our community, like having to stop at a traffic light and wait when there is no one coming. One time I was heading to work about three in the morning when I worked at UPS part-time, I was in college. And I'm telling you folks, I mean, we, we say there's no one on the road. There was absolutely no one on the road, okay? And there was a, not a car in sight, and I was running late for work, okay? So I thought, surely there is no law against running a red light when there is not one car on the road. So I went. And sure enough, a police officer was sitting there hiding, saw me, stopped me, and gave me a ticket. So we follow these laws often simply because we have to. But God never intended our obedience to him to be that way. It is supposed to be out of love for God that we serve him. It is supposed to be out of love for God that we worship him. When we come here to this place to worship God, it should be out of a sincere love for him, not out of duty. 
Too often we forget this and, and, and seek to serve God with the wrong motivations. In the first sermon I ever preached, it was on John chapter 21. And in that, in that passage, Jesus has that conversation with Peter after Jesus' death and resurrection, and of course, after Peter's denial of knowing Jesus three times before that. And, and Jesus is seeking there in John 21 to reinstate Peter, okay, and assure him that his failure to acknowledge him earlier was, was forgiven and forgotten. And he does this by asking Peter three times if he loved him. Just as he denied him three times, now he's asking him to, if, he, if he loves him three times. And, and Peter affirms that he does and seems to, to recognize what Jesus was up to there. But the interesting thing for, for us here is that each time after Peter says he loves him, Jesus responds with the command to feed and take care of his sheep. And so often we focus on that the service. We've got to feed those sheep, right? If we, if we love God, we got to feed those sheep. But what, is, what does Jesus ask first before the service? Before he ever tells him to serve him, what does he ask Peter? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? He didn't ask if he loved the ministry or if he loved the people. He asked, do you love me? If we don't love God more than our service to God, our worship is in vain. If we don't love God above everything else, you name it, family, whatever, fill in the blank, then our worship is in vain. If we are struggling in our service to God or our faithfulness to God with unrepentant sin, it, we may be skipping a step trying to serve God or obey Him with no real love and affection for Him. So worship is a spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm God as first in our affections. Finally, we have our third point, the will. Dr. Leifblad says, worship is the spiritual action of the will by which we affirm God as first in our commitments. In, in, in Romans 12, verse 1, we'll eventually get there in our other study, but uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul tells us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Frankly, I, I like the NIV translation of this better, which reads, therefore, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, in response to what God has already done for us, in view of his great love for us that he causes us to love him, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what Paul, what Paul is telling us here is that in response, in response to what God has done for us, we are to sacrifice ourselves to God, to commit ourselves to him and his will. And that, Paul says, is our spiritual worship. Commitment, folks, Commitment is a spiritual act of worship. Worship has always been from the context of ongoing commitment to God. Commitment, of course, is not a popular thing in today's world. We like to keep our options open. 
We want to be able to change our minds if we want to. We used to say that uh, about the divorce rates for, for marriages, you know, that uh, you can show people don't want to be committed anymore. But, but now, in the last few years, uh, there seems to be such a com- uh, fear of commitment that more than ever, people are just choosing not to marry and just, and just cohabitate because so, uh, they, they just don't want to commit. That's how far it's come. But we lack this. We, we, we have this lack of commi- commitment in the church as well. And because of that, many churches are questioning the purpose of church membership. Some are just not requiring it. Churches see the requirement of church membership as something that might hinder people's decision to attend their, their churches because people don't want to have to commit. But that's not what Peter's telling us here. He says we are to commit. That genuine worship involves commitment. Now, when Paul says this here, his hearers would have heard a contradiction. A sacrifice was an animal sacrifice that was killed and offered on an altar. So when, when Paul says we are to be living sacrifices, he's saying we are to be living, dying. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. Living, dying. Where does he get this from? Well, he actually gets it from Jesus. In Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus tell his, tells his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, Jesus gives three conditions for following him there in that statement. If a person wants to follow Jesus, this is what they must do according to this verse. First, they must deny themselves. That's what he says there. They must deny themselves. Meaning, if we are to follow Jesus, we must submit ourselves to God's rule and sovereignty over our lives. Okay, no free agents, no independence. We got to come under the sovereign rule of God. Denying ourselves, giving him our lives. Secondly, we are to take up our cross. He says there, now, when Jesus says to take up our cross, what, is, what does that mean? Well, it, it definitely doesn't mean Calvary because the crucifixion hadn't happened yet. Jesus hadn't died on the cross at this, at this, at this point. All right? But, but the cross was the most common form of execution by the Roman government. Okay? It's like the electric chair or, or lethal injection nowadays. So I think what Jesus is saying is to take up our electric chair and follow him. The cross was a place of death. Jesus is saying to deny ourselves and die. The third condition is that we are to do this daily. Daily. We are not to deny ourselves some of the time or part of the time. No, we are supposed to deny ourselves and die daily. There's your sermon alliteration there. I just kind of stumbled upon that. Deny, die daily. That's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do, is it? How many of us have come into a service like this and been moved by the music and the preaching and feel convicted and we leave this place saying, yes, Lord, yes. Then on Monday, we're saying, yes, Lord, I I remember (laughs) Tuesday, we're saying, oh, Lord, (laughs) oh, Lord. We're dragging the rest of the week, showing very little of the life and commitment we demonstrated the Sunday before. That's how we oftentimes are. But the command of Jesus, folks, is to worship him and be committed to him on a daily basis, every day. So you see the idea then of the worship service. When 
You've come in, you come in here, you, you've been worshiping the Lord all week. <laughs> you've been worshiping the Lord all week. Seeking, seeking to live in his presence and serving him daily. Yes, you, you get knocked down a few times, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't take away your commitment. And then you come in here on Sunday, maybe, you've been, maybe you come in here wounded, whatever, but you, you come in here on Sunday ready to meet with God along with your other brothers and sisters. You come, you come in here to get more guidance and how to live the Christian life for the next week. And you come, you come to praise the Lord and, and be in his presence together with your spiritual family because you know the blessing and encouragement you get during this time with God and his people. And then you go back out from here for another week, another week of worship. Folks, it's a daily thing, worshiping in spirit. Not a once in a, a while thing. It's a daily thing. Because really, it's all we have. It's all we have. We haven't been promised tomorrow, you see. We can't say, Lord, I need to take today off. I'll worship you tomorrow. You can't say that because you haven't been promised tomorrow. You can't say that to the Lord. And you can't say, well, you can't go back in time and, and, and make up for lost time in the past to worship him. All you have is now. All you have is today. And you are to give all you have to the Lord and worship him, him alone. To his glory. So let's recap. Worship is the spiritual action of the mind by which we affirm God as first in our values. Worship is the spiritual action of the heart by which we affirm God as first in our affections. Worship is the spiritual action of the will by which we affirm God as first in our commitments. For us to worship God in spirit or from the inside, these statements must be true of us. And so as we close, you may be asking what to do if these things are not true of, of you and your, and your worship. Well, the first thing to remember is what we talked about last week. True worship is the result of true salvation. Only God can make us true worshipers. And it was accomplished all by his grace. Nothing we did. He has paid the ultimate price on the cross for us to make us his. It was all by him. And, and, and so also with that then, those who are forgiven most those who are forgiven most, love most. Remember that? Or those who perceive how much they have been forgiven, love most. So we keep going back there, folks. We keep going back there and reflecting on the gospel and what Jesus did for us. We reflect on his grace and his promises. The way back to true worship, the way back to our hearts being truly devoted to Christ is going back to the cross and his grace. That is the biggest problem in our worship. We too easily lose sight of that. We lose sight of it is all of grace and we start relating to God like a self-righteous Pharisee instead of a sinner saved by grace alone. And then we just have to get back from there. We have to get back to affirming Christ daily as first in our values, first in our affections, and first in our commitments. 
We, we are worshipers by nature, folks. We are worshipers by nature. So if we are not affirming God first in our values and affections and commitments daily, we will be affirming something else. So we must daily practice the disciplines of worshiping God with our mind and our heart and our will. On some measure, we have to start our day filling our minds with the truth about God, reminding ourselves that He is of far greater value than anything else that would try to compete. We must give ourselves contact time with God daily. As a husband and wife need time together to flame their affections. So, so we need time with God, reminding ourselves of his love for us and affirming our love for him. And then we must deny ourselves daily of the things that would seek to remove God from being first in our commitments. We as Christians too often try to rationalize and deceive ourselves into thinking we can have God and our, and our other idols too. But we can't. We just can't. It just doesn't work that way. So if you're here today... Finally, if you're here today and you are not a Christian, let me just say to you that Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of the total surrender of your heart and life to him. He is God. He is the one who died to take your sin and the wrath of God that you deserve upon himself so that he can forgive you. And he's willing to cast all your sins away and love you as his own and give you eternal life with him. Simply turn from your sins and turn from the worship of other things. and Put your faith in him and he will save you. And then join us in truly worshiping him in spirit. Worshiping our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on the inside. And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. Father, thank you for your grace. It is only by your grace that we can claim to know you, to know your forgiveness, to, to believe that, we, that you accept our worship. It is because we do it all in the name of Jesus. It is because we do it all through, through, through Christ, and it is because you have given us grace to do so. Thank you, Father. And, and Father, we just pray for your grace on us. We, we know that we are all works in progress. We are in this, this process of sanctification. We've been saved, but we are being sanctified, being conformed to, to you, to the image of your Son, until you come back for us. When we... And when we're glorified and we will truly worship you as we ought. But Father, we pray now that you would be, you would be bringing us closer to that, Father. That you would be killing sin in us, killing idolatry in us. You, give us. you would give us the capacity to love the many beautiful gifts you have given us. But love them second to you. That you would give us grace, Father, to, to glorify you and, and to put you first above everything else, to worship you with, with, our, with, our, with our whole being, Father, with our mind, with our hearts, with our, with our will, Father. Father. 
and that we, we could give all the other gifts in our lives, we could give them the greatest gift. We could, we could show them you. We could show them how, how you are above everything else. We could point them to you. So bless us, Father, in that. Forgive us again, Father, for our vain worship. We are all guilty of that. Father, do the work so that we know the joy of our salvation and the joy of, of you, Father, your presence. That we can live in that joy every day. Father, bless us. We love you and we praise in Christ's name. Amen.